believe passionately uh, that legalizing cannabis, you don't like to say marijuana, you think it's a little divisive, you like to just say cannabis, the medical term. You believe legalizing cannabis and taxing it like alcohol would actually help us, the United States, get out of the debt crisis that we're in right now. Do you believe that, seriously? I really do. There's precedent for it. Um, before alcohol prohibition, sometimes, at times, 70% of U.S. federal revenue came from alcohol, for better or for worse. So uh, we could see the same thing with cannabis, plus the drug wars. 40 years in, trillion dollars of our tax money, and, I mean, as far as affecting supply, let's just look at this audience. It's like a Willie Nelson tour bus out here, so that's not. My name is Doug Fine. I'm a drug policy author who, as a father and as a reporter, has become convinced that the international drug war must change its focus. We are having a, actually having a solar moment here right now. Um, we had this big storm last night, and the, uh, oh, hello, goats. And the uh, grid electricity got knocked out. Vegetable oil, my gas. It drives better on vegetable oil than it does on diesel. It drives quieter. The only downside is that the exhaust, you can smell right now, um, tends to give one the munchies. Mmm, Kung Pao chicken. So, um, everybody here knows that we're winning, right? I don't mean to just foist an opinion on you here, but speaking as a human being with one of these things, okay? Um, right here, this, an endocannabinoid system. I have one, you have one, they have them in Belize and Bolivia and Mozambique and Germany. You know what it is? Does anybody not know? Show, my, show your hands if you do not know what your endocannabinoid system is. You do not know? Okay, I'm glad I asked. You have an endogenous or you are born with a receptor system for the, for the delivery of the cannabis plant and other related plants that have cannabinoids in them. Even if you have never enjoyed cannabis in the smokable or edible form, you received cannabinoids from your mother in mother's milk um, if you're breastfed because they reside in mother's milk. Um, the layman's way of telling that story is it is believed to stimulate the nursing reflex, which is to say cannabis gives an infant the munchies right from the beginning so that, that he or she is ready, ready to nurse. Um, we have co-evolved with the cannabis plant and the, cannabis, the endocannabinoid system is our receptor network. I think of it as Velcro, one half of the Velcro. This is true if you do your research, don't rely on me. If you bump your knee or God forbid have something wrong with some organ, the same thing happens. There are receptors that come up waiting for some form of cannabinoids to be delivered to your body. We're just now understanding that we have them. Um, that we have this system and our understanding of how we interact with this plant is so preliminary because how many people show of hands have heard of THC? How many people show of hands keep your hands up have heard of CBD? How many people have heard of CBC? How many people have heard of CBG? CBN and terpenes and flavonoids? Think of the interaction of all these elements in your body and we are at our infancy of understanding the plant. All we know is that it's been a tool of humanity. The strange thing is prohibition. So specific Holland message, fighting so hard to close this ridiculous back door and make the industry take steps towards being honest and not forced to deal with crimes. Yes, but I'm here to say, we, let's think way beyond this. What, I'm, what I'd like to talk to you about today has to do with this. I stepped outside my ranch in 2013. I live on a ranch called the Funky Butte Ranch in southern New Mexico. It's about uh, 42 acres, so I guess that's about 20-something hectares. And um, there was 138,000 acre wildfire, so roughly 60,000 hectare fire that people used to call a millennial event, something that happens once every thousand years. Now, it's every couple of years. I don't know if you're seeing the same strong impact in Europe that we're seeing in much of the US and in other places, but the climate change thing is not a joke. And so as we learn, launch the cannabis hemp industry, we have to be imparting regenerative values into it at every step of the way. There's no time for saying, oh, maybe later I will cultivate in a more 
regenerative manner with less dangerous pesticides. There's no time for saying next time we won't package it with petrochemical plastics um, or nanomaterials. We'll package it with recycled or regenerative packaging. We must launch the industry with these values embedded in them like a constitution now. Um, it's called regenerative cannabis um, and it's the only way to go. Um, on the hemp side, um, I thought I'd just give you a little, uh, a few stories from the field. It's a little humbling to have Ben Dronkers, the founder of Hemp Flax here and to be talking about my little hemp projects here. For those who don't know, Ben with uh, years and years of iffy profits would not let the largest hemp processing facilities in Europe go and now they've expanded into Romania and other places and I can't wait to talk to him more. So I just have to acknowledge that we're in the presence of real industri hemp industrialists here where I'm just going to tell you that um, of our 23,000 acres last year, it's, I think I have, there are some really great American um, hemp industry folks here today that um, I just want to acknowledge kind of as a group. God bless the Hemp Industry Association and my other friends from um, U.S. who are here. Shout out if I'm right. Is it going to be more than 50,000 acres in the U.S. this um, year? I'm thinking we're probably going to approach 75. 75,000. So this is Joy Beckerman, the president of the Hemp Industries Association. So, um, so the industry is growing rapidly. Um, my projects that I'll tell you a little bit about, my fingers are still dirty. This was a harvest in Hawaii. Whoops, there is nothing like, oops, let's see if I can go backwards. There we go. Um, so this is a really fun project. It's a completely unnecessary project. The our, our hemp legalization is piecemeal, state by state. And there are states that are saying we want it at the highest level. And there are states that where the governor hasn't drank the Kool-Aid yet, if you know what I mean. And so Hawaii is one of those states. So to put up a roadblock to just starting the industry, they gave contracts out to develop seed genetics, which were already available um, everywhere else. There's tons of good genetics in the US available. Um, so the only cultivar we were allowed to grow after some fits and starts was this Chinese cultivar called Yuma. It grew great. Um, and then um, no, no Americans are allowed to answer this question. Um, for a copy of Too High to Fail, what is that cloudy material in the back uh, of me as I'm harvesting um, in Hawaii two weeks ago? Somebody shout it out. Weed? I love it. Smoke? For, I almost want to give you the book just for that answer. Um, but that's not right what it is. Any other guess? guesses? Garbage. garbage? It's not garbage. Nope. That was it? <laughs> Did you know that already? I, so it, it's volcanic ash from Kilauea eruption on the next island. This is Oahu, and it was Big Island eruption. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'll sign it later. So uh, the good news is Hawaii now is actually moving. There's been so much. I'm a member of the Hawaii Farm, Farmers Union, and there was so much effort from the organization and others in Hawaii that they actually are now issuing permits, but only for this unnecessary cultivar. It's not a terrific cultivar for anything except fiber, which is the last application. As much as Hawaii needs it for things like 3D printed plastic. Has anybody seen hemp printed non-bio, uh, non-petrochemical plastic before? This is uh, the Colorado state flag. Um, and also the Colorado, where Colorado Hemp Company is represented here today. Um, Lizzie, you should talk to her. She's awesome. NOCO Hemp Expo and Tree Free Hemp. At the NCOD booth, I have one of my books printed on hemp um, by Colorado Hemp Company. So this is US grown hemp fiber mixed with a corn stabilizer printed on a 3D printer. So visualize the end of petrochemical plastics. This is reality and it's up to us to make it come forth in the marketplace. So this cultivar is not good for anything except fiber, but Hawaii doesn't have the acreage to do massive fiber at, at the beginning. So um, Hawaii's got a few extra steps to go. Oregon is one of the leading hemp states. Um, they're um, uh, rebuilding a, cult a cultivar that I helped develop that's becoming popular. Um, it's being used for phytoremediation in coal mines in Virginia, as my colleague from the Virginia Industrial Hemp Coalition, Jason, who's also here. Um, you should say hi to all these people. And I'm not trying to be jingoistic uh, and say just talk to the Americans, but it's the cream of the American hemp crop are, are uh, here with us. So. Um, in Oregon, we're redeveloping this cultivar called Samurai, which has been used for soil healing in damaged soil, which is uh, showing 34% protein, so it's a good food crop. And it's got you know, nice levels of cannabinoids, 2.5 CBC, 
seven CBD usable. Um, I've been using it in a product and then also very bulky fiber. So it's truly a crossover cultivar that can be used for many uh, purposes and I'm proud to be um, associated with it. And in Vermont, I'm, I, this is like a, an example of a state doing it right. Vermont's Secretary of Agriculture came last week, whoops, out to our planting and uh, I'm trying to use the laser pointer, but um, let's see, sorry. Um, so that guy on the bottom left, is this the laser pointer? Oh, there it is. That guy right there, his, he is Secretary of Agriculture Anson Tebitz of Vermont, the boss of farming in the state of Vermont sent by the governor to plant hemp with us. Do you see why I'm saying we're winning? We're winning this thing. Um, really what I'm, what I'm most interested in is independent farming. Um, and so this is the one sort of lesson that I want to be sure to impart to everybody today. If you're thinking about getting into hemp and cannabis, it's fine to be entrepreneurial and there's no reason why farmers can't make a good living. And it's very important to me that farmers are kept into the, uh, the value chain as it moves up towards final product and value added. That we have cooperative type models where farmers are not just slaves of commodity prices. Today, as I was being driven here by my host, Derek's brother, uh, on the, on, by boat, you know, in the canals, um, we rounded a corner and he said, that building is from the 17th century. It's where the farmers used to come and weigh their, um, you know, it was the official weights and measures to get their crops weighed. And I said, wow, were free farmers able to make a living during this period, like between serfdom and the 20th century? And his take was, no, not really. The landowners that were profiting from farming were, but the actual farmers weren't. And it's the same story up through today. The farmers of genetically modified corn in the US are largely losing money today. And we only have 1% left of, of people farming in America. I think it's all of our goal here who are from the states to get that number up through hemp and cannabis to the numbers that it was in 1937 when US hemp uh, and cannabis prohibition began, which was 30% of Americans were farming. So in my upbringing, it was the dentists and the lawyers living in the nice neighborhoods and the good houses. My vision, I hope our shared vision for the 21st century is it's the farmers and the regenerative farm entrepreneurs. If you're making an investment in the hemp cannabis industry, please include the farmers in it, in the ownership stake. Don't create hemp cannabis serfdom. That's my re request. <laughs> All right, I'll, take, I'll talk for a couple more minutes and then take a few questions. Um, I, I'm really proud of this project. This is the Colville tribe in eastern Washington in the Cascades, really Bigfoot country. Um, it gives me an opportunity to introduce another friend, Margaret Richardson of um, Salt Creek Hemp Company, one of the finest um, operators out there and just working in western Colorado to uh, the, in a struggling agricultural community. It was, it's a ranching community where people are not making any money anymore. So Margaret, Aaron, Margaret's mother, they're working together to demonstrate to a community that has very little experience with hemp um, that it's been 70 years of prohibition that is the anomaly. The, re, the traditional human relationship with the hemp plant uh, has never ended, really. So in Colville, the tribe recognized this and the tribe, tribal government doesn't agree on almost anything. And they have been comple completely unanimous on supporting everything hemp since it started. We're entering, I'm their lead consultant, we're entering our second year and we're planting 125 uh, acres. So what is that, like 60-ish hectares? And um, completely regenerative style, organic style, using natural soil building techniques, soil microbes. The tribe has been on board for everything since the beginning. It's a blessing, the product for me, the, the project for me to be there anytime I go there. And um, I mentioned it for a couple of reasons. One is, it's a terrifying project because I've always been a hand farmer. And everything for me is small scale and independent. And those of us that want to scale up a little bit are going to have to be realize that tractors and combines are going to come into our lives. And that's a scary thing. Do you know how to maintain a diesel engine? It's not really fun. I spend, when I'm, when I'm doing mechanized agriculture, at least half of each day handing wrenches to farmers who know how to fix diesel engines. It's just, it's a high ma maintenance, maintenance uh, thing. So this is about connecting the dots in our work and in our lives. Shipping, our shipping should be done more regeneratively. We should be thinking about 
not only sourcing things as regionally as possible, read your labels, don't buy things that are commercial cotton. You know, 30% of the world's pro uh, uh, pesticides are used on cotton. And the other thing is reforming our food system. Um, I would say probably, I'm guessing uh, Europeans maybe have slightly, on average, healthier diets than Americans, and you're blessed with fewer genetically modified foods. But I'm guessing that, tell me if I'm wrong, have there been increases in obesity and increases in, in diabetes and these type of things in Europe as well? Everywhere. I go to Taiwan and it's the same thing. We have to re realize that the only way to get that surcharge that we now have for healthy food, the non-poison surcharge, the higher prices from the nice supermarket, the only way to bring them down is to increase demand for it, is to demand it and make sure that it, it, it becomes normal for us to eat, eat healthy food. Um, these are two sort of paragons in North America. Do you guys use Dr. Bronner's soap out here? That's one example of that, yeah. And so John Rulak of uh, Nutiva, much of my family's uh, uh, prenatal regimen was care of uh, Nutiva organic hemp seed oil because um, at the time we were pregnant, my sweetheart was uh, not eating uh, anything that derived from animals. So the, all that fish liver oil and the stuff you're supposed to eat was provided from hemp. And we have two very healthy, mischievous um, um, boys. So. Um, that's pretty much all that I wanted to, uh, to say is let's think about uh, connecting the, the dots. I'll talk a little bit more about Europe at, um, at 8 o'clock from the main stage, but I thought since we may have a few minutes, I could take a, a few questions if anybody wants to ask. Yeah, sure. Wants to Are there ask. any questions? Any questions for Doug? Yeah, hold on, hold on, hold on. But um, like already I noticed even in the city we have tractors that are electronic, you know, and actually... Um, you can't fix them yourself. They're so complicated, you need the technician. But because a lot of young people in rural communities, you might notice, are leaving for em other employment, that would be a good incentive for young people to stay in rural er areas if there was technical work. And you also got the sunshine to recharge your own batteries. So you could skip a generation with um, spreading knowledge about how to use t diesel tractors. I am so glad that you mentioned that for all the reasons that you pointed out, but also a show of hands, I know the Americans all know it, but show of hands, how many people have heard about hemp-based supercapacitors in next generation batteries? Anybody else? So this hasn't made it across the pond yet. Wow, that's fascinating. Only, only the Americans raise their hands. So the story is, uh, this is a real deal. David Mitlin is originally a Canadian researcher who was dispatched through grant money from, from the province of Manitoba, at the University of Manitoba, to uh, do uh, studies into biofibers that might be effective in nanotechnology. He didn't have any desire to include hemp in the study. It was, he, it was funding that was forcing him to throw it in. He thought he just didn't even use high quality hemp. He just scooped up some fiber that was in somebody's barn after a seed harvest. And as it went uh, through the research chain, it started to be proven as outperforming any other material, nanomaterial, um, at that level at which ne next generation supercapacitors are gonna perform, um, slightly outperforming, but also a lot of nanomaterials are extremely toxic, as you know, and very, very expensive. So we're talking about visualizing recycling batteries. It proved to be the most effective. It has to do with the shape of the hemp molecule at the one carbon level. So as we move on to not just beyond combustion, we're now moving into our next generation batteries not proving to be that uh, environmental black hole that they are today. And what are the, what are the main forces trying to hold with all, trying to stop this? I mean, there must be, I mean, this is revolutionary. You know, it's so new that I think that um, there aren't forces out ready to, for it yet. The, those of us who are involved in business for any amount of time know there's a very big difference between the number of great ideas, like Tesla's great ideas, that were beaten out by others, even though Tesla's ideas were better, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, but, but the researchers are being funded by now by really serious investments, so I, th I think there's a chance that it may happen. Mm -hmm. um, one other thing I wanted to mention about the, about the tribal harvest um, I enjoy cannabis, um, and when I fly into Spokane, Washington, there is a dispensary that is open up, up until midnight right near the airport for the exact reasons of somebody like me, somebody who is 
leaving prohibition, where I live in New Mexico, we're in our final year or two of semi-prohibition, and coming into the promised land of fully legal cannabis. Um, in Spokane, Washington, which is not progressive Seattle, it's Eastern Washington. I mean, it's a cool town and everything, but it's not like San Francisco and Portland and Seattle and its politics. You can go up till midnight, 365 days a year, and find outdoor cultivated or sun-grown cannabis that has a clean green certification and is, you know, is gonna be as safe a product as organic broccoli that you might buy from an organic food co-op. And so I wanted to leave us with this because many of us skip the step with our cannabis. We're so happy that we could go into a coffee shop and acquire our cannabis, that's fantastic. But you're putting something into your body, whether you're eating it or, or smoking it. And we have a human right to acquire that cannabis from farmers who are cultivating it under God's sun and in a sustainable manner. Thank you. Okay, well, I have some, one, one yeah. more question yeah. left over here. Uh, I, I, I've come to the wrong event. I thought it was a comedy event, but I listened very carefully and I enjoyed it. <laughs> the thing is, the question is, I have for you is, do you, I won't use the man's name, it's one you wrote fine in my kitchen. Um, do you yeah. think the White House is supporting uh, the freedom of cannabis in, in the United States of America? Yeah, I mean, uh, to the extent that there is any coherence coming from, from the current White House, the latest statement was one week ago, um, the... Uh, person that occupies this, the, the presidency of the US right now said that he would be inclined to end federal cannabis pr pr prohibition. Yeah, did you guys hear about that? It was while you were, while you were on the side of the plane. Yeah. Hold on, hold on. That's not an automatic clearance for um, in, uh, banking, is it states-wise banking? Do you think that once they sort that out, that will like open the floodgates for um, money that's been building up inside California for reinvestment in hemp-based projects? Not just California, every, every place where there's cannabis, there are legitimate people that want to pay their taxes who are burying cash, like pirates. Um, so um, the banking quagmire, like all prohibition sur surrounded ca uh, quagmires, is completely fictitious. The, the, uh, with apologies for anybody who might work or have relatives who work in major banks, just about all the major banks have pled guilty and been implicated in, in laundering real narco money in South America and from real organized criminals, Russia and others. Um, love you, Russian mafia, don't come for me. But um, So bottom line is the, the, the bullshit pro prohibition, against, you know, the, ba the banking issue in the U.S. is Gonna go, gonna go away overnight as the house of cards falls for, for all of prohibition. Okay. Yeah. Doug, thank you very much. It's thank very you. short, and that, uh, <laughs> it's what we've got in time. Um, Stephen, don't bear. Round of applause for Doug Fine. Your source of cannabis news. Cannabis News Network.